Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks to John and Maxine for uh, inviting me back here. I was actually just in uh, Melbourne about three months ago, and it is lovely to return, although a little bit chillier this time of year. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Backbone JS today. I figured that would be a good topic for uh, this particular crowd. And to get a rough sense, uh, how many of you have uh, used Backbone before in any way? Wow, so that's a pretty great, um, great uh, percentage, but not everyone. So we're going to try to do sort of, Backbone itself is not a very large um, thing. So we can cover, hopefully, uh, many parts of the aspects of it, a lot of the philosophy, and a little bit deeper into sort of the, uh, the rationales in our uh, 50 minutes. Um, if you have any questions, I'm going to try to leave some time for questions at the end. So write them down on those notepads uh, during the talk if you have anything, and we'll get around to it. Um, and uh, I tried to spice this up a little bit with some uh, pictures of uh, your beautiful country as, uh, as we go through. Um, so Backbone is a uh, library to help you build uh, rich JavaScript applications. If you're taking JavaScript seriously in your web application, it tries to be sort of a minimal library that helps you get done those common patterns that you always have to get done. And it's still actually less than 1,000 lines of uh, actual JavaScript. There's really not much to it. Um, and so we could probably use this uh, 50 minutes as to do a thorough code review and go through every single line, but that would not be maybe the most interesting thing. So um, to give you a bit of background, um, it was released to the public a little bit over two years ago. And uh, since then, of course, there's been all kinds of, uh, of things done with it, which we'll touch on briefly and uh, many other um, libraries sort of in that space, right? There's always been JavaScript libraries to help you build JavaScript applications, but originally they were sort of of a different nature, a little bit more comprehensive and uh, full-featured and geared towards making different types of UI than you would normally do on the web. And recently we've seen all different kinds of angles of you know, libraries that just think about templating or just deal with SVG and Canvas um, or in particular aspects of UI. Um, also ones that go end to end, ones that say you have to use this database and if you use this database and this web server and this client side library will plug all those pieces together for you. So there's all different kinds of ways to tackle this problem and Backbone is a very particular um, approach. And it also started um, what is perhaps an unfortunate naming convention. So now apart from uh, Backbone.js, we also have Spine.js, uh, Ligament.js, Vertebrae.js, plain old bones which is actually a project that adds more uh, server-side capabilities to Backbone. And I think that Hambone.js and Shinbone.js are still open if anyone wants to uh, <laughs> jump on it. So um, Backbone was extracted from uh, Document Cloud. Document Cloud is the original um, Backbone application. Um, what it is is um, the Knight Foundation, which is um, part of the uh, Knight Ritter uh, newspaper chain company, the two brothers who founded it, left a large part of their fortune to a foundation that gives out grants for journalism slash technology projects, which is, of course, a pretty interesting space to be in. Um, so the News Challenge, which is one of the uh, projects that the Knight Foundation runs, is, is a, uh, a contest where they give away a whole bunch of money to, uh, to open source projects that um, aim at helping journalists get their job done or helping readers read, read the news. So Backbone was one of, the, uh, one of the larger winners in 2009. I mean, sorry, not Backbone. Document Cloud was one of the larger winners in 2009. And the idea with Document Cloud is that um, as a reporter, if you're working on a story, oftentimes the vast majority of your source material for the story is from documents, right? You're getting documents from sources directly. You're getting documents from the government. You're getting documents that are already public uh, domain and you're reading through them, you're annotating them, you write, finish and publish your story, and when you have your article printed, basically all of the source material gets forgotten about, it's locked up in a filing cabinet somewhere. Your readers never see it, because in a print newspaper there's no place to share your source material with them, right? There's, there's physically no room. Um, but online, that's not the case, right? On the web, you have as much space as you want, and it's kind of crazy that if you're writing this really, really well-researched and backed up story that you wouldn't want to share your sources with your readers because it gives your article that much more um, punch. So the idea with Document Cloud is to uh, make it easy for journalists to have a rich workspace where they can upload their source material, search through it, have it be analyzed by, um, by the service to show the people, places, organizations, and terms that are mentioned in the documents, 
Um, you can take notes inside of it and then share your notes and your documents, your original source material, with your readers when you publish the story. So basically, a, uh, an application that needs to feel sort of comfortable to work inside of, something you need to be able to log into, you know, manipulate your documents, categorize them, search through them, take notes on them, um, share your notes with other users of the system, maybe in a different newsroom somewhere else. Basically, the kind of um, application that really calls out for taking JavaScript seriously, where if you did it with just a series of static pages and filling out forms and clicking submit, you could imagine that it wouldn't be as nice of an experience to, uh, to work with. So that's the original um, extraction. And part of this is uh, the way that the Knight Foundation uh, set things up. So one cool thing about the news challenge is that everything that you do as part of your um, project is supposed to be open sourced at the end. And there's different approaches to doing this, right? So in the past, um, before uh, we got started, some, some older Knight Foundation grantees um, had done the open source model by um, working on their application for two years for the grant period. And then on the last day of the grant, um, publishing a tarball of their code base and then never touching it again, right? Which technically, of course, is one way to open source it, but it's not really in the spirit of, uh, of the thing. So what we tried to do is uh, when, as we worked on the application, um, examine all the different pieces that went into it and try to think, you know, is this a piece that would make sense on its own? Does it, does it have an API that is consistent and makes sense on its own? And would it be useful in another project? And so there's things like underscore JS came out of that, which is basically all of the utility helper functions um, that also serve as, as the core of Backbone, but that can be useful in their own right, just working on raw JSON. And then Backbone, which makes use of that to give you rich data models and views. Um, things like Jamit, which is an asset um, compression, sorry, asset, asset uh, sort of pipeline library before the asset pipeline was in Rails 3, and a couple of other things um, that are kind of standalone pieces. So apart from Document Cloud, in those uh, two and a half years or so, in the wild, there's been all kinds of stuff that's been, uh, that's been built with Backbone um, from newspapers, the new Reuters.com, which is just in preview now, as I think of yesterday or the day before they just launched it. It's kind of fun. USA Today, uh, Quartz, which is a new sort of financial um, business-oriented uh, newspaper online. Um, Salesforce's public development platform was just from last week. Um, for better or for worse, I believe it's now being, back when it's being included in the new releases of WordPress uh, these days for, I guess, making a richer, richer development um, easier to get started with. Lots of music sites like RDO, Pandora, SoundCloud, Earbits, uh, movie sites like Hulu, um, online learning, Khan Academy, um, Inkling, Code School, um, music magazines, which is a fun uh, use case for a rich JavaScript um, approach because you wouldn't usually think of them as being a natural fit magazine more of a printed page kind of a thing online, but Pitchfork and Spin and a couple others. Interactive art galleries, a Google Art Project and Artsy, and then all kinds of uh, analytics and management, of which maybe the Stripe um, management interface is a great example of, of having analytics in a rich uh, backbone application. All of which is to the point of saying that there is no sort of typical uh, backbone app, right? It's being used for things as small as little widgets that get embedded on pages up to uh, clients for uh, doing online matching for games. It's being used on the desktop and map making software with uh, web views for, uh, for doing sort of your own custom maps as an alternative to just stock Google Maps. Magazines and newspapers, like I mentioned. Interactive graphics, where you're not, you're not building the entire application, but you're doing a really richly um, interactive graphic to fit inside of a larger piece. iPhone and Android apps that are using JavaScript and uh, visual art galleries. And uh, also, these things are just the tip of the iceberg, right? These are just the ones that I happen to have heard about, um, that people email me about. But there's probably you know 98% more um, modest backbone apps out there, all kinds of stuff that you guys are working on, and a whole host of knowledge, um, tricks, tips, and techniques that is great for folks to share. So I'm hoping to maybe hear more about some design patterns from some of you or neat tricks that you've pulled off. Um, because especially at this point, I feel like maybe during the first year, I might have been able to have sort of a rough sense on what kinds of things people were doing with, uh, with Backbone. Um, but these days, sort of my experience with it and working on Document Cloud, you know, mainly and extracting it is this tiny fraction of sort of interesting approaches that people have done. People have taken it, you know, there's a whole bunch of plugins that extend it in different ways and, uh, and a whole bunch of folks who have used it in, in uh, directions far beyond the original idea, people who are using it on the server side and the client side, people who are using it on the desktop. Um, 
Uh, and so I'm always eager to hear more about those kinds of things. So I'd like to start by uh, exploring the, uh, the question and the problem a little bit. Why do we take JavaScript seriously these days? Why are we, why are we using it at all, right? It's everyone's favorite uh, language to love to hate, so why do, we, uh, why do we focus on it? And I think that the answer to this question is because fundamentally it is a more powerful way to build web applications than, uh, than we used to have, right? There are certainly still folks out there fighting against this, uh, I think, this truth, right, with Russian doll caching or whatever you might want to do, but, uh, but using JavaScript seriously and respecting it is a way to take advantage of sort of the native nature of not just you know, the web interfaces, but computer interfaces, right? Uh, probably a lot of you guys have already seen um, a recent uh, Brett Victor talk from a couple days ago that was uh, published, uh, Stop Drawing Dead Fish, but if you haven't, you should check it out. Um, to summarize briefly, in it, he argues that the, the nature of the computer as a medium um, is sort of simulation interactivity, right? The thing that the computer screen can do that the page can't do, that the, that the, pr the, the painting can't do, um, that the television can't do, is uh, react and, and interact with the user as the user uses the system. And so he uses it to talk about animations and games, and if you're going to be make, trying to make art on the computer, it should be responsive and interactive with the, with the um, audience of that art, right? With the reader. Um, or the, uh, the viewer of the, of the art object. But I think it applies to web applications too, right? If you're going to make a uh, web application that's native, that's powerful, that's useful, you might want to work with the medium of the screen and make it as interactive as you can so that it's a fluent interface for your users and not just a series of documents, right, that happen to constitute an application because you've structured the forms nicely and linked the pages together nicely. Um, and the only real way to accomplish this, right, is to take JavaScript seriously and start to, start to both add interactions to it in, uh, with, and also to start to bring your data into the client side so that you can actually accomplish, you know, rich interactions right there on the client without having to always go ask the server what the state of the world is before you go on to the next step. So that you can interact with the user in a very tight sort of cycle right there on the page. So I think that's, that's why we uh, start going down this path, and, uh, and it's certainly blooming, right? Whenever you see a modern web application launched or you work on one, um, the JavaScript front-end component of it is often sort of the most interesting part, right? Um, you know, this, there's often interesting implementation things going on on the server side, whether you're building a really smart search index um, where you've got a really difficult computational problem that you've had to develop special um, algorithms to implement. Um, but at the same time, you know, the look and feel, especially the feel, um, and the really sort of the experience is being done more and more and more in JavaScript and less and less and less by the constraints of the things that you can put into a template on the server. Um, so it might feel a bit like the Wild West these days with all kinds of options um, and maybe a little bit overwhelming even, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. It's a, it's a let a thousand flowers bloom scenario and, and it, it's a big topic too, right? Rich client-side applications is not something that we should have. There's only one way to build these and this is the right way to do it and uh, there are no other alternatives that work as well. I think it's much healthier to have a wide variety of approaches um, to, uh, and for folks, you know, even if you're just, you know, one person with a limited amount of time, for folks to still try to experiment with a wide variety of approaches. Um, so it used to be that on the client side, we were constrained to sort of a basic frame of standards, right? We used to only have HTML, CSS, and basically just, a, you know, a standard path if you're going to send data to the server, you're going to have a form on the page and it's going to post it to your you know, server-side endpoint and it's going to put it in the database, it's going to give you back a new page, and that's the way it goes. Um, so maybe five or seven years ago, if you came up with the idea for a web application, you'd probably expect most competent front-end engineers to put it together in basically the same way, right? There was, there was a right way to use clean semantic HTML and CSS, and maybe a little bit of sprinkling of JavaScript to do some animations or something as, uh, as uh, sugar on top of what was essentially a static site. But these days, if you come up with an idea for a uh, web application, your front engineer fits into an entirely different role in the design of that, right? You're probably hoping for an ambitious, you know, engaging user interface, 
and you're going to have to design the interactions into the sort of model of what it is that it does. So instead of just having you know, this series of mockups that you can navigate through, it becomes much more of an interactive um, experience. And so that's why we take JavaScript seriously. And that's what's happening with the rise of the client side as increasingly important in, uh, in these matters. And uh, to look at it a little bit historically, I think that with the current client side situation, um, right, we had the page document model that I already described. And then in the beginnings of pushing beyond that um, from form driven HTML pages to more dynamic apps, we started with Ajax, and the initial ways that Ajax was being used actually were quite conservative, which is interesting, right? So I don't know if anyone remembers the acronym, um, a maybe AJA or, or AHA, the A-J-A-H, Asynchronous uh, JavaScript and HTML, which the idea was that your JavaScript would simply post the data to the server, and you'd get back a pre-rendered chunk of HTML to insert into the page at the point which was needed. And then that was the model, right? You'd send data, and you'd get back a rendering to stick back into the client. Um, and if you think about this, this is probably the most conservative thing you can do if you're given the gift of Ajax to start to work with, right? It's saying, all right, we're not going to replace the entire page anymore. We're going to replace a single, a single piece of it every time we make a request instead of the entire page every time we make a request, which is probably a healthy thing, right? I think that it speaks well to uh, our initial engineering sensibilities that you start with a conservative approach and then, and then move on from there to what we can do with, uh, with sort of Ajax, right? It's clearly not the ideal way to build an application. You've broken up your monolithic pages into lots of little pages, but at the same time, um, you can't be really reactive and interactive on the client side with going to the server to do a rendering every time you need to do something. So then we started after that, after um, just sending back HTML, we started to have things like jQuery um, and, and sort of the perfect library for this paradigm of, uh, of posting data to the server and then doing manipulation on the client side to make it interactive. So with jQuery, you have both really good, right, so the two things it does is it gives you great cross-browser Ajax support for sending, communicating with the server, and it gives you great cross-browser DOM manipulation for updating the page together in, in one piece. So then the pattern becomes send data to the server, get back a response, and then manipulate the page to become what it needs to be, um, which is a great, a great model for getting started there. So where Backbone fits in is historically is, is in, this, uh, in this context, right, of having the page, having the server responding with that to dynamic save and update calls with little pieces of data, and then having the client try to respond to that, and watching this pattern grow to a level where things start to become tangled, right, where you begin to have such a, uh, a few cache counters here, maybe some shared references to JSON, common JSON objects over there, trying to synchronize everything with a whole bunch of jQuery callbacks, and in a large application watching it sort of get out of hand, right? Where too much of this and all of your business logic that happens on the client side, all of your data manipulation logic that happens on the client side is now tied directly into your DOM nodes, directly into what your UI looks like, directly into the structure of your HTML, um, and tied back to your API on the server. And now if you want to change something, you want to change your UI a little bit, that's a problem. Because by changing your DOM nodes and the way they're organized, you've broken all of your jQuery manipulators, which are also your business logic. And, and this is the kind of uh, place that Backbone fits in. So the question that Backbone tries to answer is, uh, what would an ideal client-side API look like? And more importantly, how can you give yourself the ideal client-side API? If you were going to program it in pseudocode, um, in, well, pseudocode in JavaScript, right? What would be the closest you could get to the intent that, uh, that you'd like to express? So to that end, I'm going to take you on a bit of a walkthrough of, uh, of some backbone. And uh, if you'll forgive me for a moment, I'm going to flip over the mirroring settings, and we'll get off to the races here. Although I lost my screen. Let's grab this back over. Mirror it change the resolution, and then we'll be off to the races. All right. So here's where we start. We start again with, uh, with jQuery. So in this uh, example, we've got 
a whole bunch of account divs, and we're going through each one of them. For each account, we're going to look up the ID of the account out of the DOM. We're going to go into our global JSON object, the account JSON object that's stuck on window. We're going to index into that by the account ID and get back out the data for that particular account. We're going to go look inside of the account um, div for the name div, and we're going to update it with the amount for the data. We're going to loop through each email associated with the account right there and uh, find out what the email address is from that global uh, JSON and stick it into a, uh, a new div for that email address um, and append that to the, to, the, to the div for the account. We're going to find the addresses um, inside, the, uh, inside the, uh, the jQuery right there and we're going to update it, update the number of addresses with that value. And this should maybe look like some pretty typical uh, jQuery callback code to you. And it might seem reasonable too, right? It's doing all the things it needs to do. But is this what you mean when you want to create an account, right? So the ideal API for this is not this big mess of code. It's something uh, more like this, right? For each account, um, make a new account view. And of course, this is cheating, right? It's hiding all of those sort of updates that, uh, that the previous example was doing. But this is really what you mean. For each account in that list of, of, uh, of data that I have, I want to make a new view and I want my HTML to come together. So this is the kind of thing you want to be writing. Um, and it is pushing that HTML into a template, but of course that's where the HTML should probably live and not inside your JavaScript code as ad hoc jQuery creation of elements and, uh, and depending, at least for, for things like just rendering a, an account view, a basic account view. So. Uh, to that extent, um, we'll talk about models a little bit too. So the basic idea um, with Backbone, right, is to uh, sever the connection between the, the data that you have and the UI that you have. So the data becomes models, which uh, encapsulate the, uh, basically whatever's in your database of choice and, and gives you nice API for manipulating that data, for mapping over it, for filtering it, for doing complex operations on it and for defining your own methods that can operate on the data in a very convenient way for you later on, and then your UI, your views. So, and then by having your UI um, be implemented in terms of your models, that gives you the dividing line, where then you're free to work on your business logic without breaking your UI, and you're free to change your UI without breaking all your business logic because you have that nice um, interface between them, and that interface is defined by the methods that a model, the models and collections um, provide. So here you've got your basic uh, document model. Um, document might have a title that you can access. The title would be a row in your database um, or the equivalent a JSON field in your database, depending on what kind of database you're using. And you can manipulate um, the, uh, the data, right? You can change the, the access level of the document depending if something's happening to it. Um, and you can change the description of the document. The way that models and views or models and other models are bound together is with events. So when you change the data of, of a, a model or a collection, an event is emitted describing that change and the rest of the system, the rest of your client side um, architecture can listen to that event and update itself accordingly. So actually I think we have an example of this um, maybe in a moment here, although yeah, there it is. So we'll get to that example in a second then. But first, we'll talk about uh, collections. So if a model you can think of is basically a row in your database, it's, it's one item. It doesn't necessarily have to be a row in your database. You can map it arbitrarily, but that's, that's sort of the default. Um, a collection is like, is like a view into a table. It is a, uh, a list of models that all share common features that you can work with. So you can say, I've got a list of documents on this page. That's a collection of documents. Give me the first one, get the source from it. How many do I have? What's, what's the number of documents in this collection? Um, look up a particular one by ID or look it up by a different, um, a different criterion and get its display title. And remember, this is what we're not doing, right? We're not looking into a global JSON um, object that's sitting at the top of the page um, and indexing deep down into it and, uh, and then uh, using sort of an external function to manipulate it. We've got these methods on the model itself. If I pass the model to a different piece of the code, it can call all the functions that I have defined on it. Um, and a big part of the, uh, of the point, although I think this is actually missed by a lot of people, probably because it's not documented in great detail because it's kind of just a list of methods, but all sorts of functional goodies from underscore are included in, uh, in backbone collections and models. 
um, which really gives you the data manipulation primitives that help make it easier to write um, fancy UIs. So map, reduce, filter, um, you know, all of these helpful functional tools that you need to say, take my documents and map them into a list of all their titles so I can concatenate them with commas or whatever I need to do. Um, map my, uh, my documents into the number of notes they have so I can sum them up and, and give you a count for how many notes there are on this page, um, which is actually that reduce example. Or filter, right? Show me all the documents that have at least one annotation. Show me all the documents that are owned by this user. Show me all the documents um, that have this particular source when I'm doing a filter. You know, these kinds of operations become much, much easier if you have this notion of a, uh, of a collection that has these kinds of functions defined on it. Um, so here's my example from before. So as I was describing with the events, events are the, are the way that you can avoid having this pattern, the way that you can avoid having to say, whenever this user changes the title of a document, whenever the save button is pressed on this uh, change dialog, right? So this is, this is kind of the default um, implementation where you say, when the user clicks save, I'm going to take that value, I'm going to call a function with that value, and that function is going to do what needs to be done. So when the title is changed, Right? I get past the ID of the note and, and the new title, and I have to go through the global JSON storage for that note. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up that note, and I'm going to set the new value. And then, oh, it's being rendered in the toolbar. I'm going to have to go over to the toolbar, get its notes, and uh, set that title over in the toolbar. It's also being rendered in the description view because I have that note open. I have to go over to the description view, set it over there. I have to refresh the details view to get the new title. And I probably also have to post this title to the server to get it to save. Right, all these things I need to do whenever the title changes. Now the problem is, right, this, so this is kind of the business logic, right? When the title changes, what needs to happen? The problem is that your UI is all in here as well, right? The business logic, when, when the title changes, now has to know about the existence of the description view and the fact that the description view needs to know when the title is being changed. Um, and so now if you change your UI, if you get rid of the description view, if you replace it with something else, Everywhere in your code that's ever had to touch this kind of thing has to go and get changed also. This is the kind of, of uh, coupling that we're trying to sever. So instead of this, the ideal way to write this um, change title function is just like that, right? Get rid of all the code. If you set a new title on the note, um, you want the rest of your system to react to it appropriately, to just simply sort of update itself. So. Uh, so the idea here is that when you set a new property on a note, it will emit an event. It'll say, I've changed. And uh, all of your views can listen for that change event. So instead, you have the description view saying, I'm going to listen to the current note. And whenever it changes, I'm going to update myself. And now, if I get rid of that description view, nothing breaks because it's just been listening to the state of the system. And it doesn't have to have its hooks um, spread throughout the rest of your business logic. Your business logic continues as it was, you know, comfortably without having to know anything about the UI, and the UI simply is watching it change and, uh, and then reflecting those changes as it goes. So this is, this is sort of closer to the ideal API for this kind of thing. Um, and hopefully we can demo some of this stuff, which would be a little bit fun. I think we've got some time for that. So I've got a uh, document cloud opened over here, which might be a little bit hard to see, but uh, hopefully you'll get the idea at least. Let me close this for now. So basically the idea is um, I've got my workspace, I've got my list of documents that I can select and edit different things about them, um, which I don't have permission because this isn't my project. Um, I can, I've got a whole bunch of different folders, right? These folders are, uh, are collections of documents that uh, Wi-Fi willing will uh, load up here. And on each document, I've got sort of you know, rich tools for analysis. So I can, I'm going to take just this first one and look at the entities on it. So here, it's going to switch back over into the list view and pop open the, uh, the entities for that document. So you probably can't see that, but I will zoom in. Um, so there were 105 people identified in, uh, in this document. And I can scrub through and see on each page the different places where Ellen here is uh, mentioned in this document. So this is an example of having data in the document model that, uh, that my UI can, uh, can read out here and respond to. And, uh, and also cache. So it's kind of lazy loaded. And if the data is not present in the model, then, um, then it will have to make a request to the server to go fetch those entities. But now that the entities are there, if I then load them up again, 
it will just be instant because they're already loaded inside the JavaScript data inside the client and you can have that much faster uh, feel, which is something that you can't do if you have to go to the server all the time to get the, the state of the truth. So this is a little bit fun because you can see who's mentioned and it also manages to, uh, to pull out different forms of the name. So you've got both Steve Bartlett as probably Stephen Bartlett and Mr. Bartlett and you've got Christopher Dodd as Christopher Dodd and uh, Senator Dodd and just Chairman Dodd, a few different versions. Um, so let's play around with this a little bit. I'll zoom back out. And what was our example? Right. So to get started, we've got this project over here, um, Ernest Withers. And, uh, and let's take a look at it. So let's do, that's a little bit big. We have a list of projects. I've got five currently in my account. If we get the first one, First, that's this object. Ooh, look at that, it's all funky. Um, if we get the first title, that's the Deepwater Horizon oil spill up at the top here. So we'll, f we'll get Ernest Withers is going to be, um, I'll just copy it over here. Oops. Projects.find Ernest Withers. So now I've got him, I think. Yep. And let's change them. So let's use this nice API and change the data. I'll zoom back in here a little bit. And so if I do project.set and I'll change the title to web directions code and I'll change the description um, also and I hit enter. As soon as I hit enter, you'll see that the, the title and the uh, description has changed there. And the point of this is that you don't, you know, I didn't really have to write any of the code to, uh, to accomplish that. I don't have to go look into the data model and update those global JSON references. I don't have to go use jQuery, look into the DOM, find that div, go into the div, find that title span, update the content of the title span because the project box right there is a view that listens to the project model and whenever the project model changes, the view re-renders itself. So that box has been re-rendered with the new title and the new description. So that's your basic example of, uh, of changes. Um, we can do this for selections so we can say Go back to the thumbnail view here and clear this out and say documents.first.set selected to true, right, and change the state of the application programmatically or select all documents dot select all and highlight all of the documents here for later analysis or whatever you want to do. So it's sort of your basic API for working richly um, with your application, right? And, and so one of the nice side effects of this is, is kind of what I'm demonstrating here of having, just being able to pop open a JavaScript console and being able to manipulate your application um, in really rich ways, whereas if you have it all implemented as jQuery callbacks to click handlers or jQuery callbacks to Ajax calls, you can't just pop open a console and start to work with your application and open projects and manipulate you know, documents and highlight things. Um, because all of the code that does that stuff is in a callback handler um, and you have to actually click on the element to invoke it and you can't sort of manipulate it programmatically. So this kind of thing becomes useful um, when you're trying to change actions together. So for example, actually the, the entities thing is one example where whenever I uh, try to open up the entities on a document, I have to switch back to the list view, um, make the request to the server if it's not there yet, scroll down to that document and then open the entities right there. And those are, those are a series of actions that I can accomplish through the JavaScript API that would be, that are used in other contexts as well and can just be used as methods. Alrighty. Zoom back out here. Um, let's talk about a few more events. So um, one example of this is, uh, is add and remove events. So collections are, uh, are lists of documents, I mean, are lists of uh, models and as you go through collections, you can have these things be nested. So in our workspace back over here, we've got the, uh, the projects is a list of projects, project models. Um, that's a collection right there. The, uh, the documents is a list of documents. That's a collection. And then each document has a list of notes, which is also a collection. So you've got this nested sort of structure where a project has many documents, a document has many notes, um, and, uh, and you've got this hierarchy. And you can do lazy loading with these different levels of, uh, of optimizations. So when you first load the page 
for a project. It's only going to load the, the at, in the collection, it's only going to load the documents for that particular page you're looking at. It's not going to load the entire table or all the documents in the project. And it's not going to load any of the notes inside the documents, right? You can populate that collection later on and then work with it. So we've got the same kind of, uh, of model here where when I load the collection, it pops open. And then the first time I click on a note, of which I don't think I have any on this page, Here's one. The first time I click on a note, it's going to have to go to the server to get that note. And then after that point, the note is already populated. And I can just look at it whenever I need to look at it. So that's the notes collection nested inside of that uh, document model. And one uh, cool feature here is that with events, you can have them sort of bubble up. So you can listen to them at different levels in the hierarchy. So um, any event that happens on a model, whenever any data is changed inside of a model, whenever the title is changed on a document or a note or the author is changed, um, if the model is in a collection, it'll bubble up through that collection. And you can listen for the change on the collection instead of the model. So instead of having to listen on every single model that I have, all I have to do is say, whenever a, uh, the title of a document changes, period, right, in the entire document's collection, I want to be notified of that. Um, so. So that's a good example of how you can use collections to, to listen sort of globally and, uh, and make easy updates. Whenever a new document is added globally, I want to know. And you can also do it for specific attributes. So you can say, um, whenever I only care about when the title is changed. I don't care about when other things are changed. I only care about when the author is changed. I don't care about other things. And you can get the old value and the new value to compare the two. You can say, you know, a change has just happened. What was the previous value? What is the current value? Um, this is just an example showing how you can listen for changes in title and then alert the two versions, which I'm going to skip uh, for time. Now on to views. So if that's your basic sort of uh, model structure, you've got your data, you've gotten out of your database, um, you've put it into models, you have added functions yourself for working with it, you have uh, sort of, you have the events available to you for observing whenever changes in the state of your application happens. Um, with your traditional view. So this is an example of maybe a very clean jQuery view. If you just have a, uh, a raw jQuery application, then this would be an example of one way of doing it sort of cleanly, right? Where a view is a function, um, and then you go through, and when you create a new uh, note view, it's going to go through the element itself, and it's going to bind a whole bunch of handlers to uh, functions to work later. So we've got a note view prototype with a whole bunch of implementations. Whenever it's opened, expanded, the details are being shown. And then we bind our events right here. So a backbone view is sort of similar to this, but it's a nice convention for saying, um, here is a logical piece of UI, right? It, is, it makes sense in isolation. I should be able to reuse it in different context. Here are the events associated with it. Whenever I click on the view itself, it should open. Whenever I click on the expand element, it should expand. Whenever I mouse over the title, it should show the details. Um, and then you can implement it there. So backbone views don't do very much for you. They're mainly sort of there to, um, to give you a place to organize a, a logical chunk of UI that can react to changes in a particular um, model or piece of your application. Um, they give you delegated events. So all of the events in this uh, hash here are delegated down from the views element which means you don't have to worry about whether or not the view is present in the DOM or what state it's been rendered in. One thing that happens quite a bit in jQuery is uh, you'll want to bind something, but you don't have that element yet, right? That element, may be, it might be being rendered asynchronously as a result of a callback, so it may or may not be present on the page, so you can't bind it until you know that it's actually there. And there's a little bit of ordering dependency. And it's nice if you don't have to worry about that. If you can just declare um, whether or not this view has yet been rendered, whether or not it's in the DOM yet, I want all of these events to be able to be responded to and just have that work with delegation. Um, so the bare bones of uh, what the view needs to do is to render itself, to, uh, to display itself. And the most simple way of doing that is just sort of this implementation. Take my, uh, my element, my jQuery element, um, and then uh, render my template and stick it in as HTML, right? That's your basic take this template, render it out, given the data in the model. So I'm getting passed in the model here. And uh, rendering the template and sticking it in as HTML into the DOM. And of course, if you want to get fancier, you can get fancier. If you want to just have um, a method for just rendering a particular little piece of that view, you can go ahead and do that. But this is the basic sort of common level um, approach. 
And then you listen to the model, you listen to it for changes, and you re-render when appropriate, and you're off to the races. Um, so now templates, right? Instead of having this kind of uh, mess of HTML, the idea with uh, inside your JavaScript, not being syntax highlighted correctly or anything like that, the idea with templates is to put that into a template file um, where you can have nice syntax highlighting and you can have um, interpolated code with logic or without logic, whatever your preference might be. And then finally, routers are the last sort of piece of backbone that I'd like to demonstrate, which are just a way of mapping URLs to, your, um, to the different logical locations in your application. So there's sometimes a misconception that you need a, uh, a route for every single state that your application can possibly be in, which is often not the case. There's many things that don't need URLs, right? You should think about designing your URLs as, uh, as places you might want to bookmark or share with someone else or go back to later with the back button. So when you open up a dialogue, a pop-open dialogue to do some little trivial thing, that's probably not something you need to have be bookmarkable. And it would probably be weird if you hit the back button and all of your old dialogue boxes started popping up that, that, uh, that you were at before. So the URL should be used for things that feel like a different logical page. Um, and Backbone provides some nice uh, helpers to give you a way to match URLs to functions that are, that are callbacks whenever that URL is navigated to. So internally, you can just move around yourself, and then whenever the user hits the back button or loads a bookmark, you'll get this callback from the router saying, oh, the user's going over here, the user's going over there. And a couple new features in, uh, in Backbone uh, 1.0 um, that are worth a mention are uh, smart updating collections. So previously, you had a model set where you can set an arbitrary list of data on your model and get a whole bunch of different change callbacks. Um, changing the different attributes. Now you can set a whole bunch of models on a collection and get all the individual add, remove, um, and update, and change events. Um, and, uh, and it works kind of the same way of just changing the contents of the collection to match the list of models that you pass in. There's a new method called listen to on views, um, which inverts the control. So normally with uh, an observer, um, you on the thing that's being observed, you add a function to it to say, whenever you change, call this function, give me a callback. And this kind of inverts it for views, it, or actually for anything that mixes in backbone events, but in this case, it's mostly views, where you say, I'm going to listen to this guy over here um, for changes. And this gives you a really easy way to automatically clean up everything that you're listening to um, from the view when the view is removed without, the, without having to go back to the model to unregister those, those callbacks. And also, HTTP patch support. So traditionally, whenever you do a post um, or a put to this, especially a put, whenever you do a put to the server, by the spec, you've had to send your entire representation of your data over to the server. And often, it's nicer just to send only the little pieces of data that you know have changed. And HTTP patch is great for that. So that is my, uh, my brief demo. And let's pop back over here. Actually, let's pop back over here and get on with the mirroring. There we go. So I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of the philosophy of uh, Backbone. And I think that open source libraries in particular need to have a strong philosophy. And if you don't have one, then as soon as the library becomes a little bit popular, it becomes swamped with patches that, uh, that tend to pull the code base in different directions and becomes sort of a jack of all trades and a master of none. And so let's look a little bit at sort of the unifying uh, philosophy for Backbone. So the main thing is to get the truth out of the DOM. As I've described before, if you have your data embedded in your HTML, then all of a sudden you can't change your UI without breaking your business logic. And fundamentally, that's what working on an application is. It's you know, reworking the UI. Unless you have it sort of set in stone and it's never going to change from day one, that's the most important thing that you do, right? Is saying, oh, this isn't quite right. I'm going to refactor this. I'm going to change the way that this works. Um, and when that's tied together, it becomes very difficult to do. And when it's completely separate, it becomes very easy to do, right? Basically, as soon as you mock up that new UI, you can plug it into the events that your business logic is already emitting, and you're off to the races. And for example, you wouldn't want to have the speed of your car be determined by what it says on the dashboard, right? That'd be backwards. If you use your interface to drive how fast your car is going, you want your, your, your interface, what your, what your uh, reader is seeing, to reflect the actual state of the world, the actual state of what's actually happening. Um, Backbone is intentionally minimalist, right? We're trying not to add or over-prescribe anything um, that, uh, that might not be the, the correct thing. So if it's not going to be useful for 80 or 90% of Backbone apps, we're probably going to leave it out. 
And for a long time, we actually resisted adding the router um, sort of under this rationale, but it, it turns out that it's actually used by most, by most folks. Um, and, and that means that we're on the hunt sort of for those particular features that are useful um, when building rich JavaScript applications in the 80, 90% use case uh, scenario. So if you, uh, if you have features like that, I suggest you to uh, submit them. Those are the kinds of things that, uh, that we look for. It, we try to keep it small. Because it's minimal, it also tries to stay small, um, simple and efficient, mostly so you don't have to worry about it. Especially in the, not so much these days, but especially in the context of Internet Explorer 8, Internet Explorer 7, um, you know, JavaScript performance is really uh, sort of critical. And if your library is doing too much stuff, then uh, it can constrain the kinds of applications you can build because you can't implement certain things uh, efficiently. So ideally, Backbone is never going to be the bottleneck in your uh, implementation. You shouldn't have to code around it. It should just be something you can use without having to worry about, uh, about, you know, about la introducing lag or anything. And uh, I think this is actually a little bit more important than it is in other circumstances because JavaScript is a special situation. In most programming, you can throw as much code at the problem as you need to. Um, if you throw, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're if you have 400, you know, k of code or 2k of code. Um, if you're talking about Ruby or Python or C, because it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really affect the end user at all. In JavaScript, it does. You know, we still have, you know, slow internet connections. We still have uh, mobile devices. We still have situations where if you really want a fast, responsive app, you can't just throw code at the problem. And so, being sort of lightweight is is a virtue. Um, we're driven by use cases. So if you ever open up a feature request or a, uh, a change without giving a good use case, without motivating the reason why you want this particular thing, um, you're probably going to get some pushback. Um, so, uh, so ideally, you know, these use cases are sort of that same question of how do you get closer to the ideal API for the particular application you're building? And those kinds of answers, when you describe how this particular feature gets you closer to that ideal API, are the best way to make your case for a, uh, a new feature in Backbone. Um, UI agnostic, which is uh, less of a big deal now than it used to be, right? In fact, it's almost expected these days. But uh, a couple of years ago, when, uh, when Backbone was first launched in the context of things like uh, JavaScript MVC, Dojo, UE, Sprout Core, Cappuccino, the expectation was that any JavaScript framework worth its salt would include a complete widget library and look and feel. Um, but, uh, but that's not the idea at all with Backbone. Ideally, your HTML structure, your CSS structure, and your interface can be anything um, at all that you'd like, and, and Backbone's not going to describe that for you or prescribe that for you. It's sort of the, uh, the minimal convention that enables the statelessness without an opinion about what your, what your interface should feel like, the freedom to design the full experience of your web application. And to that extent, we try to be uh, prescriptive and not proscriptive. And by this, I mean that Backbone wants to recommend with authority and not sort of forbid by law. So with a framework that decides everything for you, um, you can end up incidentally forbidding many different useful patterns, um, kind of the thing that Angus was talking about with, uh, with uh, you know, if you forbid some things, then there's all kinds of useful patterns that get thrown out the window. So if you're stuck inside of a run loop, then getting outside of the run loop is hard. If you're stuck with logicless templates, then using logic um, in your templates is, of course, uh, forbidden. If your framework encompasses a templating language built in, um, then, uh, then you're using that particular one. And uh, you know, one that might not even work on IE8 or on the server, depending on what the, on what the language is and what your needs are. So in contrast to that, while we recommend relatively coarse-grained UI updates for simplicity and performance, um, doing really granular binding works as well, just fine. While we recommend push state-based URLs, if you want to use hash-based fragment URLs, that works fine also. And Backbone can translate between the two of them for you. While we recommend a synchronous UI rendering by default, so everything looks solid and doesn't flicker in and out in strange ways, making a particular part of your UI asynchronous um, is easy as well. Well, we recommend keeping your data models flat um, so that they can be easily manipulated relationally and saved to a traditional database. Arbitrarily nested models um, are also supported just fine, especially with the plugin um, and that kind of uh, not prescribing um, choices is important, I think. Um, transparent source code. So one of the big goals of the project is to, you shouldn't be necessarily expected to read the source to Backbone if you're working with it, but it should be really easy and pleasant to do, and you may well, well want to, to get a better understanding of what's going on underneath the hood. To that extent, it's a single file, nicely sort of annotated, and, uh, and you can just go through and browse it and enjoy it, hopefully. Um, Worth addressing, at least briefly, that uh, it doesn't really matter whether you call Backbone MVC or MVP or MVT or MVVM or MV whatever. 
Um, and it's often, I think, harmful to try to shoehorn your code base into a strict MVC, um, where you often find the most deformed architectures are where someone you know, treats it as dogma that every single this has to have a controller there, and, and you don't really find the natural feel for what your application is. So the fundamental um, thing that all of these different paradigms have in common, whether it's MVC, MVT, MVVM, um, whatever, is this separation between the views and the models, right? Your data and your interface, your uh, business logic and your design component. And that's the, that's the, uh, the business logic UI split that I've been talking about um, this whole time. One interesting thing about Backbone is that everyone has invented this particular wheel before. Um, it's always fun to see all the different little libraries sort of come out of the woodwork. And uh, a lot of the core stuff in Backbone has been done many, many times in many different um, little libraries. And, uh, and it's great to hear about them and learn from them. Um, in particular, Robert Kiefer is an engineer who I used to work with who's been doing this type of thing um, since the early days of DHTML and the original AOL uh, webmail client. So it's really sort of an eternal uh, pattern, at least as far as JavaScript goes, which is not very long at all. And my final point here is, is in the philosophy of Backbone is uh, statelessness sort of as, as the way of life, right? The less you have to worry about what the current state of your application is, the more it can just be automatic and, uh, and whatever the state of the data is, everything else just reflects that without you having to, to do all kinds of work to make that happen is the end goal of, uh, of having a really easy to change uh, web application, right? There's a lot of inherent complexity in adding these interactions and adding this rich model to a JavaScript interface. And your enemy is all of the implicit state that can be added up there. Um, and so to the greatest extent to which you can say, this piece of code is going to respond, and it doesn't care about the rest of the app. The rest of the app can be in any state whatsoever. I, I don't have to worry about it. And in isolation, this thing just reflects this piece of data. You know, that makes everything much easier later on, where things are less tied together. Divide it like that. Um, in brief, what might the roadmap be going beyond Backbone 1.0, which was just released a little bit over a month ago? Mostly a big cleanup push there, um, semantic cleanups, which are the best kind. Um, but the fact is that it's basically stable these days, and it's been effectively stable for a while now. So 1.0 was mostly just a formalization of the fact that the fundamentals of Backbone haven't changed in about a year. Um, so there's a little bit of talk about a few minor things, like, uh, like maybe using jQuery's uh, built-in promises more for the result of asynchronous calls. But that's still TBD. And, uh, and basically, it's, uh, it's just bug fixes and polish and tweaks and tune-ups and cleanings, which also means it's a good time to try to introduce new ideas if you have a great idea that you think would fit that 80 90% use case that I described before. Um, and it's also a fertile time for new research topics. Right? Things like unobtrusive backbone, uh, server-side backbone, which a bunch of folks have pursued, of getting your same models to work on the client and the server. If you look at Groupon's uh, Holy Grail project or Airbnb's uh, render project are both sort of ways of, of doing this. Um, full end-to-end -end syncing um, and pushing, basically pushing the limits of what it would mean to program with the ideal API for your use case are, uh, are things that are always uh, interested in. And I've got my own. Uh, sort of fun uh, pet projects of ideas of you know what it would mean to have a system that that knows about all of the changes in state from the database through the server side application down to the client side application and can program programmatically push those changes of state all the way through the system to bake out all of the pages that need to be updated. Um, whether you need whether that can be done in just JavaScript or whether you need a language that knows what you know the dependencies for each function are in sort of the data flow nature of it is an open question, but I think that's something that'll be fun to play around with and uh, a fertile research topic of which there are many. So I think I've gone a little bit over, which is unfortunate for questions, but uh, thanks a lot, folks, and I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to talking with a bunch of you.